Admittedly, it's been a while since I was in design school. So let's hear what a recent bootcamp grad has to say she's learned since graduation. another episode of Design Today. I'm your host, Dylan Winspear, and today's episode is a really insightful one for those of you who are in school or nearing graduation. But before we get into it, a quick sponsor plug. Today's episode is brought to you by me. Design Today has a website. It's easy to find. Head to designtoday.com. There you'll find a few rad things, starting with the Slack community, which is begging for you to join. There you'll also find insightful conversations around UX and other nonsense. Additionally, you can sign up for the newsletter to be notified when recent news is about to drop, like the first ever Design Today course. It's a freebie too. I've put together a course, it's short, but it's filled with a dozen or so videos to help you get your resume in gear. That course right now is in beta and I'm receiving a lot of great feedback. Uh, if you'd like to be part of that beta group, join the Slack community and shoot me a message. Finally, on that community page I mentioned, uh, there's a link to the Design Today Patreon page. What is Patreon? It's a crowdsourced funding page where you can opt into a few different tiers to support the show. Every dollar counts. I've said this before, this is a labor of love, and I really appreciate anything that you can do to contribute and help. To my few Patreons, I love you. Back to our episode, my guest today is a recent bootcamp grad. Uh, granted, this was recorded last fall where she had already been graduated for about six or seven months at that time. Olivia Laboriel is an awesome person to know. She's super kind and super insightful. When I met her last year, I knew I needed to get her on the podcast so that she could share some of the insights that she's gained since graduating from her boot camp. We hit on a few things like, what's the job hunt been like? Uh, what do you wish you would have paid more attention to? And while you were in school, what did you stress over that you now realize didn't warrant the stress. It was really a fun conversation. You'll enjoy it. Thank you, Olivia. And now let's get into it. Uh, Olivia, thank you for taking the time, though, to come on the show. I appreciate this. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, we met a couple, a couple months back yeah, now. Yeah, a couple months. Um, and after getting to know a little bit about your background, I know you came out of a boot camp. Uh, and I was just really interested as you're hitting the field to capture some of the thoughts uh, that you've I guess been having as you've gone from a boot camp student to professional in the field. Yeah, there's and I, a lot. Yeah, there's a bit that I know that we can talk about, and I, so I appreciate your willingness. Uh, before we jump too much into the concept uh, or this topic, tell me a little bit about your background, how you got into UX to begin with. Uh, I guess maybe what piqued your interest in you know, how you ended up where you're at today. Yeah, so kind of a roundabout path like a lot of people take. Um, my degree is in public health. I really liked the visual aspects of mm -hmm. public health campaigns, loved designing that stuff, um, and I started to get interested in why people do what they do. Uh, from there, I went into software marketing after I graduated. It was health software, so cool. it's still relevant. Um, and I worked for a small startup, and I really kind of felt like it started to pique my interest in the product, and I was on the marketing side, but wanted to be involved with the product, yep. like I was missing out. So I I got laid off from there, not on purpose, but just happened. Um, and then it I worked at a call center for a little while and thought, what am I going to do next? And stumbled across UX, and I thought, that seems like a combination of everything that's piqued my interest. How did you stumble so, across it? Like what? You know, I knew someone who had gone through Dev Mountain okay. um, and had kind of looked into it. And I was actually trying to convince someone else that they should try it out. Yep. And while I was sitting there working in a call center, texting this other person about why they should mm -hmm. consider going to a boot camp, I thought I should probably <laughs> consider that. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And then you got involved with the boot camp. How much longer after the call center? Uh, within a few months. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, your boot camp was how many weeks? 13 weeks. Okay. So for a lot of the listeners, they found themselves in boot camps, uh, not necessarily with Dev Mountain, but maybe Dev Mountain, maybe other ones. And right. I think they all tend to fall in that 12 to 16 week. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one that uh, I've mentioned that I'm involved in that's a bit of a longer program. And uh, and then I've also 
work closely with uh, Utah Valley University, and they've got a four-year program. In fact, right. I just had uh, the uh, the guy who kind of oversees all of the four-year 123 credit UX course. Wow. I just had him on the podcast just uh, a week or so back oh, and cool. kind of talked about some of the things that you can win uh, by doing a four-year degree, but also some of the the cons that go along mm-hmm. with doing a four-year degree. Uh, so I'm really interested in kind of getting your take on, uh, I guess, how you ended up here. Um, you graduated how long ago from the boot camp? In February. Okay, so that mm-hmm. was seven months back? Yeah, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And for the last seven months, what have you been up to? So I worked at another small startup mm-hmm. as the only UX designer, okay. which was... Was that right after graduation? A few months okay. of job hunting, but okay. yeah. And that was great. Loved it. Got laid off from that job too. And another, happens. Another startup. They keep coming back for those. Um, <laughs> and then I've been freelancing and working at Dev Mountain since then. Okay. And what kind of freelance work have you been doing? Um, so I have a job where I am working on a software engineering software. Okay. And it's, a, it's pretty complex a little over my head but I'm yeah. hanging in there working yeah. on it and then another one that I just started is for a dental practice marketing software cool so and how are you landing these freelance projects so that first one that I've that's been ongoing they just reached out to me on LinkedIn it's cool. kind of lucky break and then this one that I just now started is with my old boss from my most recent job one of the startups? Yeah. So where he went after okay. that ended, they needed a freelancer. The so power he, of networking right I there. know. I know. And I was really grateful for that. So Cool. Yeah. Well, let's get right into it. We talked about wanting to cover some of the things that you've learned since Dev Mountain. Uh, and I just want to kind of get right into it and ask you, I mean, since graduation, you've gotten yourself into the field. Tell me a little bit about the things that you've learned since graduation. So... It it's just so different in real life than it is in theory. And I think that's like a great summary of yeah. everything that when you're practicing in boot camp, you're doing every single step by by its textbook definition mm-hmm. as well as you can. And that just doesn't carry over. Why? It it it's because kind of like we we were talking about a, a minute ago. It has to fit into a business. It has to fit into the company. And you're not just a rogue UX designer running around creating a product by yourself. Mm -hmm. There's other pieces that are coming into play. Um, Business goals. Sometimes you have limited resources for one reason or another. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Those are. No, I mean, I totally agree with it. I mean, you're right. Right before we got into this, we were talking a little bit about the fact that uh, you have this perfect working uh, or schooling experience, right? Where everything is kind of laid out in a, in, a, in a way that allows you to go through and take the time and, uh, you know, learn and experience and try new things. But it's not always feasible to do once you land that first right. job, right? Right. And you ask so many questions when you're a student in the boot camp, you're constantly asking like, what about in this scenario or what do you, when do you do this? And the answer is so often it depends. Uh-huh. And that's like, that can be so frustrating. Like by the end of the boot camp, I was starting to like cringe when I heard like it, it depends. depends. Yeah. But now I have some work experience and I'm teaching and now I'm the one saying it depends. And so do you understand why? I mean, it's, it depends yeah. said so often. So what is that reason? Yeah. Well, it, it depends on the business structure, yep. on what the project is, yep. on on how important the user is to the company too. Yep. That you know, and how important their convenience or enjoyment is. What the product is. It it's just a range of different scenarios that would impact how you approach UX, what pieces you can leave out of the process and what pieces you really need to focus on. Yeah, I can't remember the saying in Latin, but there's a saying for something about like in the perfect uh, experience, like in the perfect example. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what school is, is like this is like the ideal scenario, but you realize that once you get into the field, there are so many variables. Right. I mean, one of the variables that could just throw you for a loop from day one is like, what if your company just doesn't value UX? Mm -hmm. You know, or they don't understand the value of UX. That will totally then change what you do next. Yeah. 
right? So mm -hmm. have you run into anything like that? Um, I've run into maybe that specific elements are not as valued, like okay. research. Okay. And maybe like market research has been done and the need for specific UX research is, is really hard to yeah. communicate. Yep. Um, and maybe it just doesn't fit into the budget or the time frame. Yep. And there's just no point in fighting for it mm -hmm. over at the at the expense of of your job or the good relationships you have with your coworkers. Yeah. So, yeah, that's something that I've seen a lot that like maybe the foundational research that you really focus on and is maybe 25 to 30% of your working time in a boot camp is really compounded and maybe you have like a day or two to figure out what you're going to do and then move because you need to get deliverables out sure that makes total sense mm -hmm. so let me keep going down that topic and maybe you've got a couple other examples but what else were you stressing about in school that maybe you're realizing today didn't desire didn't necessitate the need for that much stress yeah one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately was my personal design aesthetic, my visual skills. Interesting. Um, part of that came from like looking at Dribble and you see all these things and you're like, man, I'm never going to get a job because when I try to make a palm tree, it doesn't look good, <laughs> you know, you know, or like I can't make those like those cartoon people that are really popular right uh -huh. now. And I was like, I got to figure this out. I'm never going to get a job without that. But, um, you know, or just like refining my taste. And, and I, you know, I have an aesthetic and I have things that I think look good. And that's, I think that's important for landing a job in terms of how you present your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how well you perform on the job, it, it can be pretty irrelevant. It, as 100%. long as you know, like good design principles. Yep doesn't really matter what your taste is because no one asked. <laughs> now, if I remember correctly, your portfolio though wasn't, I mean, it's not an ugly portfolio. Your portfolio you. looks good. So, I mean, was that something that took a lot of effort for you to, to get to that point? No, not once I realized I didn't need to be so worried about okay. it. You know, I have a, a pretty minimal design aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I, I like just kind of clean. I love white space. Um, and once I realized like that was okay and I don't need to have cartoons on it or anything yeah. and probably shouldn't, yeah. uh, that got a lot easier. And I think visual design got a lot easier once I realized how simple it could be. Sure. No, it makes sense. I feel like uh, a lot of people aren't sure like to what standard their portfolio should be mm -hmm. in, in boot camp. Did you start your portfolio while you're in school or did you wait till after school? So I had written case studies i think maybe i had two done when i finished the boot camp and they were just published on medium mm -hmm. um and the way that we do it in the boot camp is we just kind of leave it open so that we suggest encourage students to create a portfolio site once yeah. they're done but the minimum expectation is that they're published on medium so yeah. i finished boot camp with that and then decided that i wanted to make my own portfolio site which is kind of interesting because the more involved you get in job searching and the more you talk to people, you hear really conflicting reviews on whether or not this hiring person or this company even looks at your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Like, it seems like like 95% of people who are hiring are like, I've never read a case study. I haven't read a case study in like a year. So, why do, we, I mean, so why do we keep doing them, right? I, yeah, I know. And that's something that I've kind of been wondering myself is like, is it just the portfolio, the ability to put the portfolio together? Is it the work that goes into it that matters? I, I don't really know the answer, yeah. but I thought that the way that I wrote my case studies was very important and I was really concerned about that. I think that happens because I think college did that to me. Sure. You know, that I'm like, I, and the first one I wrote was like super formal and dry and the feedback on that was like, okay, nobody wants to read this. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, I think there, I think it, you can be a phenomenal UX designer with a very bad uh, artistic eye. I think mm -hmm. that is totally possible. Yeah. Um, but I think more often than not, when people are looking to hire UX designers, they still look to see like, 
how good of an aesthetic do they have? Yeah. Even if it's not related to like what we do as UX designers uh, at all, we still kind of judge a cover by its book, right? Right. Uh, one of the things that I found that I do when I look at portfolios or case studies is I just look for personality. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will not, I don't think I've ever read an entire case study, but I'll you know, pick out just different sections to read. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, have they found a way to interject their personality? Because that's really what I want to know yeah. about at this stage. Mm -hmm. I want to know about their personality. Um, what advice would you give for those students who are in a boot camp right now as it relates to portfolios? Oh, man. I would say focus more on networking. <laughs> I would. Um, but... You know, I guess getting feedback on your portfolio as part of your networking that, you know, not that you're sending out like something bad to like the general public to get mm -hmm. feedback on because that's probably not a great approach to take. But, you know, as you interact with people, ask them like if they're hiring people, look over my portfolio and let yep. me know what you think. And, yep. and would this stand out to you or not? Because that's kind of I think that's the bar. Like there's right. there's a line where you're either going to stand out or you're not. And if you're above that then I think you have a shot, you know, yep. if not, you're, you're not going to get it. Now, call. if there are those handful of listeners who are the avid listeners of the podcast, they will know that I've said the exact same thing on a dozen occasions, right? I care more about informing the, the student to get involved in networking more than I care about them taking their portfolio from 90% good to 99% right. good. Because mm -hmm. that, I think just like that last 10%, is overkill mm -hmm. you know as, as as long as your portfolio looks competitive i think it's good enough yeah so you said networking why do you think networking is more important then um i think my most helpful relationships my and the a lot of the opportunities that i've had are strictly because of people that I've introduced myself to mm -hmm. or been fortunate enough to be introduced to by someone else um I think that's a huge benefit of, of boot camps too, yep. is, is that there's kind of an automatic community that you have of, of past graduates or past employees of that boot camp. The alumni. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, and I feel like that has been a huge boost for me. Okay. Did you think you, that networking, well, maybe that networking did cause you, you're currently, hopefully we can say this currently you're working at Dev Mountain. Mm -hmm. Did that network help you get that job at Dev Mountain then? Yeah, I mean, I, I think because I stayed involved and connected, that mm -hmm. opportunity was there. Um, and it's the same thing with my freelance job, the the one I just now started. That's from my former boss. Yeah. Um, and I think the more you grow your network, the more those opportunities grow. It's a kind of an exponential yeah. effect. So let me go back to the, the first question I was asking. Maybe you can come up with another answer. Maybe you don't. But what else was it that you were stressing out pretty hard about that, uh, again, in the seven months that have passed since graduation, you realized maybe I didn't need to stress as much? I was pretty concerned about what the position would be. What do you mean? The position of a UX designer. I I just didn't know what it was. Oh, sure. And that was concerning to sure. me. And I was just... I really had a hard time figuring it out. And every time we had guest lectures come in, I would ask like, okay, what's a day in the life like? Okay. Yeah. And then I couldn't really pick out very many patterns except that everyone would say like there's meetings. <laughs> but, you know, I'd be like, I, I don't understand. Like why is everyone's answer different? And yeah. I get this circles back to like it depends. But, you know, I really wanted to figure out like what this role looks like and where is the the boundary between where my position ends and someone else's responsibilities yeah. start. But it is just so unique to the company that you're at and it's unique to the, the person. I have had experience where people have asked like, do you, do you do this kind of thing? Like in the startup I was at, they were asking like, would you want to do some marketing work? And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, you know, my priority is going to be UX, but if there's, other marketing things i'm happy to jump in and pick sure. it up so it's defined by the company that you're at and the person that you are sure did it scare you that even while in school you didn't have a clear picture of what you'd be doing after school yeah it, it really terrified me i was nervous about a lot of things it sure. just it just made me nervous the the investment in school and it really feels like 
oh, you're doing a boot camp. It's this huge leap. And it is, but at the same time, like, it's not like a life or death situation. Yeah. And you're not going to, like, put yourself in, like, financial ruin by gaining more skills yeah. regardless. Is yeah. there anything that a student could do to understand a day in the life of better now while they're at school? Uh, I think shadowing. Yeah, okay. And that's something that at least at Dev Mountain, if a student's leaving for the day to shadow, like that's totally fine. And we even facilitate that a little later in the course. Um, but I think as I started shadowing, I started to see like, okay, every company is run differently. Yep. And they apply the UX skill set yep. differently. That's interesting. I had a uh, opportunity to post a an opportunity to shadow us at Domo. And I really just thought I posted in a local community mm -hmm. and I really thought like four or five people would take me up on it. I had like four months straight blocked out with one, with somebody shadowing every single week. I bet. Yeah. And it was just insane how many people were eager to jump mm -hmm. into it. And maybe that comes back to just the fact that they're still curious at what does this actually look like? Right. Like I'm hearing everything in theory, but what does it look like now in practice? Who do I sit with? Like, mm -hmm. what is the environment like? What what do these meetings look like? And, you know, I think that the hard skills that you learn in a boot camp, no doubt are important. I mean, that's going to be the foundation of what you end up doing. But there's a lot more to UX than just those hard mm -hmm. skills, right? If you spend all day in your meetings, are you learning about how to conduct meetings in a boot camp? Right. You know, it's yeah. not really a part of the curriculum. And... You know, if uh, if you've got a developer who's really irked over the fact that you designed something custom when they just want to use something native, have they taught you how to deal with that situation yet? Yeah. You know, so all these different things, these these variables lead to, uh, well, it depends, you know, your, yeah. your day will change, you know, depending on what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me ask you, uh, what was the other question I wanted to ask? Is there anything that... Um, again, going back to the students who are in school, is there anything that you would recommend that they do pay a special attention to in the curriculum that they're learning? So I don't know if this is common across all of the courses, but at least at Dev Mountain, there's, there's a project with iOS students, which is awesome. But then there's also a day where they lecture a little bit about the other side, the, mm -hmm. the code side. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think I probably tuned that out pretty well or it just went over my head, so I don't know. But I would have liked to go into my first job being able to communicate with engineers a yeah. little better um, and to, like, not have to interrupt to ask, like, what is what is Python? I've never, like, I don't sure. understand that word in this context. Sure. And, um, it would have given me a little <laughs> more con confidence, I think, you know? No, I totally, that makes total sense, especially if there are words that you've never heard of. Like, yeah. tell me more about this snake that you guys keep yeah. refer referencing. Yeah. Like, I don't <laughs> want a snake in the office. I'm not down for snakes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, it totally makes a lot of, that's a stupid joke anyways, but that, it totally <laughs> makes a lot of sense. We had a, uh, we use a company, uh, that we call Cybidge uh, to do a lot of our QA testing. And when said really quickly that Cybidge tested this, I had an intern who was like, what are they saying? <laughs> like, why are they talking Deeply about... Deeply offensive. <laughs> yeah, like, who's this Cybidge that they keep asking to do all this work? Like, that is like, I'm so confused. <laughs> like, oh, no, it's, anyways, there's a lot of these acronyms that pop mm -hmm. up. There's a lot of these... One of the things that drove me nuts at Domo and still drives me nuts, like these teams don't have like very front facing friendly names mm -hmm. like our mobile team is the least creative team at domo we just call ourselves the mobile team but you know what we do we've got other teams called tron and gambit and bakers and like you have no idea what those right. teams do yeah. based off of those titles yeah. um and so again it just leans to or it it just leads to the fact that again you get started at a company there's gonna be a lot of things thrown at you that you don't quite understand I don't know how to prepare for that though. Like what yeah. do you do to learn more about what the developers are facing? You know, I honestly think like a vocabulary list would be a great Helpful. place to start. Yeah. Like just Google like what are the different code languages or like how to talk to developers. Um, I think that would give you at least a foundation to have heard of these things and to be able to communicate a little bit. Yep. Um, and then... Also, we're in Dev Mountain. We're working with the the iOS students. 
and to really take advantage of any opportunities like that. Mm -hmm. um, I also I think it'd be a great idea. I haven't done this personally, but um, here's my advice that I haven't followed: <laughs> is is maybe seek out an opportunity to shadow a developer for a day. Sure. And you know, have them explain like what they do with the designs that they receive. That yep. that really how that worked. It blew my mind like mm -hmm. that I the, the front end developer is like waiting for me to give him something and he's doing what I have designed as like, am I his boss? I don't know. Sure, <laughs> you know? Sure. It was just it, the way that that worked, the flow, at least in, in that very small startup that I was in where it was one to one, um, the way that that communication worked, it was awesome, but I just had no expectation of that. I had no idea. Did you, I mean, so that's on the development side. Did you have, I mean, how did you feel about your business savviness, like your business knowledge? Did you feel comfortable there? Um, I had worked a little bit in marketing, like I mentioned. Oh, that's right. So I kind of, I knew that businesses needed to be viable. I did not appreciate how relevant it was in UX. Yeah. And, and I think that's just a natural consequence of working on hypothetical projects for a couple of months. And that's your experience there are no business constraints involved yeah. in a hypothetical project. And maybe we should start throwing that in there. But um, when you get into a real job, it's more about the business than it is about the user. Keep going on that topic. Tell me more about that. Well, it's kind of painful. Like you get kind of shattered as like this brand new, like bright eyed UX designer that I was just like a few months ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, you think like, I'm going to do everything to make this the best possible thing for the user. Everything's going to be free and they're never going to run into like anything that's going to prompt them to upgrade. I hate that. Don't ever want my users to experience that. And we're going to release all of the features that they need right now. And we're not going to release the features that they don't want, you know, right, and, right. and it just, that's really kind of the mindset that I had. And then going into a job you realize that's just not realistic. Yep. And that that wake up call comes like very fast. Why isn't it realistic? Because there is a business on yeah. the other side of the user and the business needs to be viable because you as the designer and your coworkers and your boss are all trying to feed their families. Yeah. Um, and it's more important that the business continue to operate than it is that every single user is happy. Yeah. And that's really hard to face. That being said, the user's happiness is good for business. Yep. And that's no why doubt. UX designers get hired. That's yep. why businesses are like, okay, I guess we have to invest in UX. It's because there's a return on that investment. Yep. So humor me as I shared this story again. I shared this as right before we got started, but it was the, uh, for those who are listening, it was the other night that I was teaching school and mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what was said, but somebody said something and it was just, it was one of those trigger words. And it just brought this concept that you're describing again to the forefront of my mind. And I go over the last couple of years, I've seen so many designers just tank because they don't understand this point. Yeah. You know, I see so many designers leave, go to different places, you know, end up unhappy because they, they think, and rightfully so, that UX designers defend the user. Like, we are the front line for the user. And that's fantastic. And I don't deny that. But at the end of the day, the user's not paying your paycheck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got a business that is still paying and providing for you to sit in that seat and do that job. So it comes back to you've got to be able to blend the two together. Right. So what thoughts do you have on being able to balance defending the user while still maintaining the business needs? What are your thoughts? So I guess as long as it feeds that goal of, of UX creating a return, if you can justify that this specific approach will make the user happy, which is good for business because mm -hmm. of what the user will do if, you know, it, it increases the their use or their the way that they share talk about the pro the product um if you can justify an anticipated return on what you're doing yeah then i think that that's a good balance okay. um but yeah it's it's hard to be realistic because it's it's not charity and it's not all about like alleviating the suffering of the people it's about like how do we make this 
business viable by making it something that people enjoy using. And that's yep. where that's where UX comes in. So let me give you this scenario. Let's say your boss comes to you and says, we've got this feature that we want to push out. Uh, it has got the potential to create a whole new rev revenue stream that we haven't experienced yet. And you in the back of your mind know there's not been a single user who's asked for this. Uh, I don't know whether this revenue stream is going to be even beneficial for the company. How do you handle the situation? I, I'm a pretty open person. And I guess if the setting was appropriate, I would probably express those concerns. Sure. Um, I tend to assume that my boss has more experience than me. I've never been in a situation where that wasn't true sure. uh, in any job. So, you know, of course, like respectfully bring that up and say, you know, hey, as the UX designer from the UX side, like, I'm not seeing how this fits together. I just wanted to throw that out there. But at the end of the day, it's it's your call. So what if they come back and they say, no, I, I get it. Nobody's asked for this, but we believe that this is going to be a huge benefit to us. They're paying my paycheck. So, you know, if, so if they're do, paying me to make it. How do you go back to your desk and live with yourself? How do you do? What do you do? You know, as long as I'm not actually like hurting anyone, uh -huh. you know, I can I can live with myself. And I think most things that I can do as a UX designer aren't going to really cause anyone to suffer. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think that sometimes like your job is like doing something that you're really passionate about because mm -hmm. you know, it's going to help people and it's going to be good or make their jobs easier or their lives easier. And other times it's like, you know, I don't, I don't really get this. Yeah. I wouldn't want this as the user. I don't get how this fits into the goals of the company, yep. but you just have to trust it because yep. You, you don't own the company. <laughs> you know, and I think the only other piece I would add to that is you still have the opportunity to defend the user in that situation. Mm -hmm. You yeah. can pick up the business's need or their desire and now go about the UX process to make this need or desire as user focused as possible. Right. And right. one of the things that caught me off guard when I started my career was how much work I actually end up throwing away. Mm -hmm. Like how much work will never see the light of day. You know, so again, I've, I've grown more comfortable with that, knowing that like, listen, I'm, I'm okay doing this experiment. If business wants to justify doing this experiment, I can go along with it mm -hmm. and I will give it my best shot. One of the other things that I've seen people do is they, they go, you know, I don't agree with this. It's not going to work. So they give it a half hearted effort right. and it gets picked up on real quick. Mm -hmm. You know, people know when you didn't give this an honest chance. So again, I found a lot of, uh, I, I found a lot of success in working with executives when I take their idea and run with it to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And I note the different potholes that may arise from this different idea. And I will give them exactly what they asked for. And I will also give them what they asked for swerving around a few of those potholes. Right, right. And, and, and I think building on people's ideas is actually really validating to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be kind of mm -hmm. like, you're like, oh, I don't want to step on any toes. But if you say like, hey, I liked what you suggested here and I built on it and I incorporated it into this. And this is kind of the solution that I'm coming back at you with. Yep. You know, and that's really, I think, validating. And I think it supports both sides of it. Yep. My very first big project that I had at Domo was legitimately a, uh, a wire framed on a napkin version of what this feature should be designed by our CEO. And I was given these CEO hand-drawn wireframes and said, finish designing that and, and build mm -hmm. it. And immediately when I started dissecting this and going through everything, I was like, oh no, what? how do I tell the CEO of our company that this is a bad idea? Yeah. And it's not about telling him it's a bad idea. It's about helping him uh, or her and my CEO helping him getting to the point where he saw what it was that he was asking for and then recognized the fact that, you know, he only put 10 minutes of thought into it. He didn't put 10 weeks of thought into it. He didn't do any testing on it. Uh, so saying like, this is what you asked for. And then we noticed a couple issues that arose in doing it. Here's how we got around them. And when we took them on the journey of how we got from the, the napkin drawing to our end solution, it was like, great. Thank right. you for flushing this out. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Yeah, and I think that's it's kind of interesting you say that because when students come into the boot camp, they're very 
solution focused and so they get presented with their prompts and you can see that you know i don't know probably 75 percent of them immediately start talking about what the product is going to be rather than you know going through this process at least you know even i I know you have to take shortcuts in the real world but there's still the thought process of ux if nothing else right um you know and so being able to understand what is being asked is it this specific feature or is it the functionality of it that you need and what is the what is the need that this is filling and yep. are there different ways to approach the solution yep so i've got another this is kind of a tangent but another question i have for you i'm often asked as i teach uh these these ux curriculums i'm asked like is there like a step-by-step guide to doing this and i i always like well, you know tell me a little bit more what you're what you're talking about and they're like well there's so much to this and there's so many different discovery methods and definition methods like is there a checklist that i can go through to make sure i don't miss anything did you ever feel yourself thinking that way oh absolutely absolutely and thinking like oh no what if i forget a step in the process and and i i I for sure thought that when i before i'd ever had an interview Uh i was fully expecting that they were going to ask me to like recite the UX process (laughs) from like A to Z, including Uh like every possible thing and when you would need to do what. So yeah, I was, I was ready to give a textbook answer. Um, and I definitely thought that way and would get hung up on like, you know, what if I do user story mapping wrong? You know, what if Uh I learned, what if I learned it wrong? Um, you know, and kind of worry about the, the fine details of, certain approaches yep. um and and it's interesting to see now that it's based so much on on my thought process and how i organize my thoughts that when we do these ux things they're to help us organize research organize information and then move forward and organizing research and information in a way that doesn't make sense in the context is yep. completely pointless yep. it's a tool to move through the process and communicate with the people around you. Yep. And however that needs to be adapted, is going to work fine. So what what's the short answer that you give to somebody who says, uh, hey, Olivia, what what checklist do you use? It to depends. Get to- <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can't full circle on that. Yeah. What do you tell them when they say, like, Where, where's the checklist? Uh, I need a checklist in order to get through this. What, do you, what would you tell them? In terms of their projects? Mm-hmm. So we guide them through and we tell them like, you know, what you're doing at this point. So at this point, you should be working on this specific sure. thing. Right. Um, but once they get out of school and they're still trying to, they've got this checklist mindset, mm-hmm. how do you help them transition away from that? You know, it's kind of interesting because I, as a student, thought that I was going to need that checklist on hand but it was surprising to me and has been surprising to me to find that most of the deliverables that are expected of me are asked for. Mm-hmm. And if they're not asked for, and I think maybe they need it, you know, there's there's time to like clarify yeah. on that. And it's yeah. not like anyone's ever going to just say like, hey, build this product and just check in with me when you're yeah. done completely. And you're going to need to have like the whole process in a in a folder and deliver it over to them you know it's usually like hey why don't we get started with some ideation can you do some sketches really fast and we let's talk about what you have yeah and it is pretty step by step and whoever is in charge of you your boss or your team will communicate what's needed yeah and it's not necessarily a, a quiz every time you right have yeah to do this no one's process. putting you on the spot right yeah well I appreciate you sharing your insights is there anything else that you would give I guess umbrella statement is there anything you would tell somebody who's in a boot camp right now learning about UX I mean what is your final statement here I think to learn how to learn UX and and people say that about all different types of school education but you know a 13 week course is it's not enough to become a master in a field and everyone wants to be good at what they do. So soak up every opportunity you have to learn, pay attention to resources that are cited so you can revisit them so that when you get on your job and you realize you 
you don't know what you're doing, mm -hmm. that you know where to go to figure it out. You have people, a network, mentors, and you know which sites to click on when you Google, like, what am I doing? Yep. Um, you know, so just to absorb every opportunity, listen to podcasts. I've heard of Design Today is a really great one. That's a good one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that would be my, my main suggestion. Cool. Uh, after this podcast, I'm sure people are going to want to reach out to you, ask you questions. What's the best way that they go about doing that? Um, I'm on Slack, Product Hive, under my full name, LinkedIn. My email is my first and last name at Gmail. So okay. <laughs> any of those things work great. And I'll spell your last name correctly in yeah. this so that they, they don't mess that yeah, up. Yeah, pronunciation is, you know, whatever you want it to be. But there is <laughs> one spelling. So. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for your time. That's, uh, that's a wrap on this episode. Thanks All for right, listening. All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.